Welcome to the Heart and Lung Research Podcast, a window into the world of research at Royal Brompton and Harefield Hospitals. In this episode, we will be speaking to Dr. Anand Shah, a respiratory consultant at the Trust, who specialises in lung infections and covers a spectrum of diseases, including cystic fibrosis and bronchiectasis. I'll be speaking to Dr. Shah about his own research into lung infections and the research that's been carried out globally. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Shah. Do you mind giving us a bit of background on what you do and how you got into lung infection research? Thank you, Zara. So I am a respiratory doctor and I look after lots of different individuals who have a wide range of respiratory problems. Whilst I was training, I spent a lot of time working here at the Royal Brompton Hospital with Professors Lobinger and Wilson, looking after patients with chronic lung infection. And we had a big population of individuals, unfortunately, with fungal infections. Alongside that, I also spent a lot of time in our lung transplant unit over at Harefield Hospital and again saw a number of patients there who had really problematic fungal infections. And what struck me was really that there was a lack of good diagnostic ability alongside uh, a real lack of options in terms of treatment with unfortunately often not great outcome. Uh, And there appeared to be a lack of understanding about what's causing fungal infection and also how we can best treat it. And that's really what's inspired me over my career to focus on respiratory infection, but particularly fungal infection. Your research focuses mainly on lung infections that affect patients with cystic fibrosis and bronchiectasis. Do you mind explaining a little bit about these two diseases and any differences or similarities between them? So bronchiectasis can be caused by many different diseases and factors and cystic fibrosis is a genetic disease that primarily manifests itself with bronchiectasis which is a scarring of the airways leading to recurrent infection. Within cystic fibrosis, scientific advances have been very great over the last 30, 40 years, and we have a really good understanding of the genetic causes of the disease. Within bronchiectasis, we're further behind in terms of understanding the cause for a large proportion of the patients. The similarities would be the susceptibility to similar infections, so that can primarily be bacterial infections that colonise within the lung, leading to recurrent infection, uh, and also fungal infections alongside fungal allergy, um, which can make the disease worse. And what's the difference between fungal and bacterial lung infections? So in terms of what they can cause, the outcome can be very similar with regards to increasing infections or worsening disease progression. The difference we have at the moment is that bacterial infections are actually much easier to diagnose in terms of culturing the actual organism itself in the laboratory and also their susceptibility to antibiotic treatment where we struggle with fungal infections is often understanding a if there's a fungus there as our culture techniques are often not that successful and also how best to treat and whether that's the cause of any problem you often have a situation where a patient has a fungal organism in their lung alongside bacterial organisms and trying to tease out which one is causing the problem can be quite difficult One of the biggest differences is that healthy individuals, by and large, don't get fungal infections. So there has to be an inherent susceptibility, either in your immune system or an underlying damage to one of your organs for you to have an infection. Whereas bacterial infections, as you know, can affect anyone, um, even healthy individuals. So what makes patients with lung diseases more likely to get bacterial and fungal infections? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question, Zara. So I think the the bottom line is we know some of the reasons why they get bacterial and fungal infections within specific diseases. So, for example, we touched on cystic fibrosis, and there's a lot more understanding in that context of the underlying defects that it results in the immune system. But again, even within a disease that's much better characterized, such as cystic fibrosis, there's still a lack of understanding as to definitive problems that happen within the immune system that lead to fungal infections. And that's an area that we're targeting within our research currently for different diseases such as bronchiectasis or why people develop significant allergies to fungal diseases. There is still a large gap in our understanding as to why this happens. I think some of the things that are key characteristics, however, is that there definitely does appear to need to be underlying damage to the underlying organ itself so there's a local immune problem there also needs to have a nice home for fungus they tend to want to live in places that have cavities or poor oxygen concentrations for example and that combined with a abnormal immune system allows them to thrive and how do you diagnose and treat fungal and bacterial infections in patients with lung disease It's an interesting question, Zara, so over the last five decades, the way we diagnose bacterial and fungal infections by and large hasn't changed, and that's usually involving culturing a sample from the respiratory tract in a petri dish in a laboratory and seeing what grows. 
that's far more successful for bacterial infections, but unfortunately for fungal infections, the yield can be pretty poor, so often only about 20% of fungal infections can be diagnosed in that manner. Over the last five to 10 years, there's been rapid advances in terms of being able to detect the DNA from pathogenic organisms like bacteria and fungi, and that's something that will definitely translate into clinical practice, I'm sure, over the next five years. The difficulty is standardising the tests that we use and understanding because we can detect a sample, does that necessarily mean it's the cause of any infection? Alongside that, there is newer point-of-care tests that are trying to detect different things that are secreted by the fungal and bacterial organisms. And again, that's an area that's rapidly advancing over the next five years. So far, that's mostly been shown to be useful in the invasive fungal setting for people that have severe immunocompromise over the, the next sort of five years, I anticipate that that will translate hopefully into patients with more chronic lung infection. So what research are you working on at the moment? Broadly speaking, my academic interest lies within improving outcome for individuals with fungal infection within chronic lung disease. That separates out into improving our ability to diagnose infections, and that's looking at different methods of um, molecular diagnostics, so that's using DNA or RNA for detection alongside point of care testing that's tests that you can use at the bedside that can give you a rapid test within 15-20 minutes to give you an idea whether there's an infection there or not alongside that there's again a lot of research that we're currently doing to try and better understand how we can interpret our imaging of our patients so ct scans in particular for people with fungal infections using machine learning or artificial intelligence to give us a better idea of whether someone has a fungal infection and whether it's deteriorating or improving looking at how we can improve treatments. One of the key areas really is to better understand how the host or the human immune system actually works when it encounters a fungal pathogen. Fungi are something that's that are in the environment all around us and we've evolved over generations to try and tackle them and not get an infection and also not have an enhanced immune response to them. What we don't clearly understand is what goes wrong in chronic lung disease and why we either have an exaggerated immune response which leads to allergy or we have a defective immune response which leads to infection. And that's a really key area for us to understand so we can try and identify pathways that are abnormal and target them with either immune modulatory treatment or alternative treatment options. And lastly, looking at different antifungal options and how we can best use the drugs that we have at our disposal through better monitoring and stewardship and also um, looking at clinical trials for newer antifungal agents. So we've all no doubt heard about the global issue of antibiotic resistance and how close we are to reaching a point where they'll no longer be effective against everyday infections. How does that affect the research you do? It's a huge problem that really has had a lot of media attention, but within an antibiotic setting primarily, the problem of antifungal resistance has really been under-recognised with regards to the public um, and also the media. So antifungal resistance is a global epidemic around 20% of crops are lost due to fungal infections. And one of the problems that's led to is that the use of antifungal agents that are very similar to what we use in the human settings are used widespread within the agricultural industry. And what that's led to is a rise in antifungal resistance that we're encountering within humans. Alongside that, we have a large proportion of patients who are chronically on antifungal treatments for a number of years. And again, alongside the agricultural use, that's been a, a big factor in our antifungal resistance. Um, that we're seeing. And the difference with, between antibacterial and antifungal resistance is that our therapeutic options are much more limited. Um, there are only four classes of antifungal drugs and only really one oral option that we primarily use. So if there is a global epidemic of antifungal resistance, we have very limited means as to how we can tackle this. And there is a real risk of a real catastrophe in our ability to treat people with an infection that currently already has a mortality rate, which is greater than uh, malaria and breast cancer within an invasive fungal setting and is a significant increasing problem within a chronic lung disease setting as well. Do we have an alternative for antibiotics? Is that where research is headed? Absolutely, that's an area that we're looking at. So we've been lucky enough to have some funding from the Cystic Fibrosis Trust to look at immunotherapeutic options to try and really understand better what pathways are abnormal and what's leading susceptibility to fungal infections in a chronic lung disease setting, in particular cystic fibrosis. The hope is that we can identify pathways that we can then target with what we call immune therapeutics. Um, this is an area that's rapidly evolving within cancer setting, for example, um, or a rheumatology setting. 
and it hasn't really translated into infection practices yet, um, but that's an area that I think is particularly exciting that we can use uh, alongside our antibiotics and antifungals so that we can make better use or salvage our use of our antifungal agents and give them better outcome. Alongside that, for antifungal resistance, I've recently been awarded funding from the Medical Research Council to really get a better idea of how antifungal resistance is evolving over our chronic lung patients. And hopefully by getting a better understanding of that, we can have a better appreciation of how we can initially detect antifungal resistance and also how we can try and stop that from spreading. And finally, where do you see lung infection research headed? What do you see yourself focusing your research efforts on in, say, the next five, ten years? Broadly speaking, I think the areas that are going to be really interesting to focus on is how we can use precision medicine and translate that across all infection areas. Cystic fibrosis really has been a vanguard in this area, and it will be really exciting if we can able to replicate some of the success they've had by being able to really molecularly and mechanistically identify the problem that's causing the disease and identify pathways that we can target using either small molecule or genome editing cell-based therapies. One of the challenges that we're going to have is that all of these treatments are obviously very expensive and are person-based. And one of the challenges the NHS is going to face is if we are successful, hopefully, in finding therapies that can be useful in this setting, how we can manage to fund this across you know, large populations of individuals that unfortunately have lung infection. Some of the techniques that are being developed very rapidly now with regards to either stem cell or cell-based therapies and cutting-edge genome editing presents a really innovative, exciting area of research And one of the things that we have to do across chronic lung infection is really identify our patient groups carefully uh, and understand which groups are susceptible to what particular types of infection and why. And then once we can do that, hopefully translate that into clinically meaningful treatments that will improve their outcome. That concludes the end of our interview. Thank you very much, Dr. Shah, for taking the time to speak with us today. And thank you for listening. If you'd like to find out more about the research that's carried out at Royal Brompton and Harefield NHS Foundation Trust, please visit our webpages at www.rbht.nhs.uk forward slash research. The research mentioned in this podcast was kindly supported by the Cystic Fibrosis Trust, the Medical Research Council and Vertex Pharmaceuticals.